Hello and welcome back to Russ's Movie Corner. My name is Russ, and as you can see, I am sitting in front of my movie corner. I'm wearing my Guarding the Galaxy t-shirt, and I have my Bible, the Epic Miniseries, right next to me. And judging by this nice little video around me, we are taking down another atheist. And today, well, it's an oldie, but a goodie. This is Simon Dan. Now, this video is called, You Don't Want to Visit This Creationist Science Center. I saw this video pop up in my feed because I do watch his Flat Earth stuff. I will say this, Simon Dan does a fairly good job talking about Flat Earth. And it was so funny because in my comments section, and I'll get into this on the Comments on Comments episode, but in one of my comments on my comments section, somebody was like, well, you know, you're just a flat earther. And I'm like, uh, no, I believe in a round globe earth, dude. You can't, you can't just assume that everybody that's a Christian believes in the flat earth, right? Like, we all don't believe that. Most of us believe that, yes, the earth is a ball, because what is a circle in three dimensions? A sphere. <laughs> So, you can't tell me what I believe, <laughs> okay? His Flat Earth stuff is really good, and he does a fairly good job of explaining stuff in the Flat Earth videos. What he ends up doing is kind of pushing some of that stuff to the side when it suits him when it comes to things like this. So, <clears throat> today, last time we started the video... And I kind of explained the Hoven theory. So if you haven't seen that, go back, watch part one, then come and watch this one. Or if you know if somehow you popped up in this video, you're probably going to want to go watch that one to get the context of what we're talking about in this one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and right as we left off, what we were talking about when we get to this point is because we have this nice little um, Komodo dragon here. Um, is that Damien? one of the uh, tour guides at the Science Center um, down in Lenox, Alabama, Dinosaur Adventureland, is explaining that reptiles wouldn't grow, or wouldn't stop growing. Okay, Their whole entire life, they continue to grow. And it's the same thing that we see with the dinosaurs. And that's why the dinosaurs would have been so big, is because in the time of before Noah's flood, they would have been you know, they would have grown for, you know, they would have grown like weeds. They would have just been growing and growing and growing. And he was saying that they found in some, in some, uh, amber, they found in some bubbles, they, they, they drilled down to the things and then they tested the, the gas inside and they found that there was 32% oxygen in this thing. And Simon Dan was like, well, yeah, cause that was like 330 million years ago. And I'm like, yeah, but there's two things wrong with that. Number one, you can't know that that layer that that was found in was 330 million years ago. And number two, how was it that pressurized? Because Kent Hovind's theory of the three finger thick, about, what, inch and a half, two inches thick of ice around the entire globe would be an ideal pressurized container to make oxygen at 32%. Okay, and then he said, well, and then at about like 33 million years ago, you know, the, the oxygen content was lower than what he mentioned. And I'm like, yeah, probably because that was post-flood. Because at that point, all of the green things that were growing on the earth were dead, and all of the people were dead except for Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Okay? And their wives. <laughs> Noah's wife and, and the three sons' wives and the animals on the ark. That's it. Those are the only things that are living on the earth at that point. Everything else is dead, completely gone, kaplute. Okay? So that's probably why the oxygen content at that point was low. Okay? Because it was so much so that it was like, you know, because there was no plants to change the CO2 into oxygen. And there was no canopy to hold the oxygen down because the water bursting forth which we read in the Genesis account in the last video, the water bursting forth would have cracked that canopy like an eggshell, okay? And so some of that oxygen would have escaped with the water, okay? So there probably would have likely been some plankton and some 
algae and stuff like that that would have and 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 probably some seaweed and some various things like that that would have released some oxygen in the atmosphere but the oxygen would have been drastically reduced okay and the and the co2 content would have been much higher okay and then as the the water started to recede as plants started to come back into existence the atmosphere would have settled out and that's where we get our 21 percent and so I asked them to post down in the comment section of the previous video, answer me those two things, okay? I mean, I, I just, I just want to know, how, how do we know at 330 million years ago, because we don't, and they can't possibly know, but how did they know at 330 million years ago that there was so much oxygen in the atmosphere, but then number one, where did the oxygen go? And number two, how did that oxygen be contained? Because again, the gravitational pull of the Earth hasn't does not flux, okay? So it's not like in some areas it goes up to 32%, and then in other areas it goes down to 10%. And it's not like our, our atmosphere is fluxing, okay? You, you guys got to answer those. If you don't answer those, then you don't have a theory. Let's continue. One of Dr. Hoven's longevity charts here. People living before the flood into their 900s, floods happening here, and you see how the ages drop off rapidly after the flood. Oh, the global flood that there is no evidence for. And the... <laughs> oh, God, you gotta love it. Okay, then, genius. Show me where the erosion marks are in between the layers you won't find them because if there was truly layer if there was like a layer that was laid down okay that's supposedly 65 million years old and then there was some time a come you know a few million years before the next layer which is like 30 million years old where are the erosion marks for those millions of years? You don't find those in the layers. You know why we don't find those in the layers? Because they weren't laid down millions of years ago. Good luck. You're going to need it. 900 year old people which again there's no evidence yes there is so one of the things they know about people as they get older okay their cranial the, the cranium back here starts to elongate okay and that's why people start to kind of hunch over as they age okay because their brain is getting bigger and so to accommodate it your skull actually starts to extend so extrapolating this out if people lived to be 900 years old because we've seen some people that are like 130 that not 130 I shouldn't say but like 105 108 you know they live to be that long that old their heads tend to be a lot larger than the normal adult Okay, a normal human adult skull. And so if somebody's living to be 900 years old, how far would their skull elongate? Hmm. Probably look like Homo Neanderthalus. Yeah, Neanderthals, people. Because we actually tested the DNA from the Neanderthals and we found out that it is like 99.9% .9 compatible with human DNA. I mean, so much so that if they could figure out how to make a sperm and an egg cell with it and, you know, do IVF, they could probably grow somebody, um, you know, they could probably grow one. So, yeah. 
we know that there's no difference between what they call Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus, and Homo sapiens. There's no difference in terms of DNA. Or the DNA is very, 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 very slightly different. But we're talking like 99% compatibility, compatibility to where it's, yeah, it's pretty much human DNA. And that's why we say that they either dress down the human bones to ape to make them look more apish, okay, so that they can say, look, it's a hominid, or they take the ape bones and they, they widen out the hips a little bit and then they, they dress them up to make them look more human or hominid so that they can say, look, it's an ancestor of humans. And then it comes out that it's, you know, that they found it in known ape fossil beds. And when they're challenged on it, they quietly take it out, but they leave it in the textbooks and then they teach it to the kids in school. And it's so funny to listen to them <laughs> in the comment section. Oh, you, you don't know anything about Lucy. Yes, I do. I know that Australopithecines is a bonobo ape skeleton because it was found in a bonobo ape skeleton bed. And it was so funny because the guy happened to find it like a week before his grant money ran out. All of a sudden, he found a skeleton in the dirt. Can you believe it? Well, not the whole skeleton. He found partial fragments of it. But it was enough that the people gave him some more money. So he stayed there and tried to complete the skeleton, but he couldn't. And it's so funny because these people will say, Oh, well, they have like, you know, hundreds of these skeletons sitting in, in, the, in the Museum of Natural History. And I'm like, Then why are they parading around Lucy, an incomplete skeleton that they literally took a cast of the hip bones and like shaved them down so that they could open them up to make them look more human. They literally, the guy literally stood there and said, well, huh, huh, they didn't fit. They looked more apish when we put them together. Oh, well, you know, I mean, as, as, you know, monsters, as, um, you know, people crunched around them, uh, you know, near a lake bed or something, crunched on the bones oh it must have they must have just kind of ground the bones together so that it it just looks that way let me fix it with my dremel they literally said that and nobody in the scientific community went oh uh, 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 dude wait <laughs> that's not right man what are you doing why why are you you literally took a dremel tool and went and then went oh look at that it fits perfect yeah, if it's perfect when you sand both sides back and then super glue them together, it always looks perfect. I do that with my models all the time. I pull them off the sprue. They don't fit. I clean up the little mold lines and, you know, maybe, you know, give it a little bit of a roughing up with my little file and then I put a little bit of super glue. And, oh, there it goes. It fits perfect. Yeah. You can make anything fit. It's how people kit bash. That Lucy is literally a kit-bashed bonobo ape skeleton. That's all it is. And people like this guy believe it. And it is absolutely hilarious to watch. Because they have zero evidence otherwise. Okay? The evidence of the global flood is all around us. You are choosing scam man dan you are choosing to say i don't want to you know oh there's no evidence for this global flood yeah there is it's literally in the dirt it's all the fossils and yet you want us to believe that there's no life no life no life Ooh, some trilobite fossils which probably got buried because they're bottom feeders and then, boom! Animals. And we're supposed to believe that all of those came out of a trilobite? This is the biggest fairy tale for adults. And as if by magic, they just, poof, appeared. No. Sorry, buddy. It's full. Great. Good stuff, Damien. Well, it says during the flood, the fountains of the deep broke open. So if the crust of the earth was one solid piece that before that flood, imagine all the pressure built up under the crust. If all of a sudden it gets released, 
with enough force, it might be shooting rocks up into the atmosphere. If that ice canopy is there, it would shatter. All the super cold ice being magnetic would have been drawn to the poles. You get your polar ice caps. I think you're confusing regular ice with superconducting magnets, which need to be really, really cold. But... No. He's not. See, what Damien is saying is, is that when you super cool ice, okay, and it already has natural minerals and things in it, those minerals become magnetic, okay, because of how the, the bonds are aligned, okay? People know this. And I think what you're going to find out from Dan here in just a second when I play this clip is that he is confusing because he sees that hammer coming down on that big chunk of ice and breaking it. He's going to assume that all of that ice around the, the Earth from the Hoven theory is like gigantic chunks of boulders. That is a pretty wild stretch all the same, isn't it? I mean, come on. They find mammoths frozen, standing up, with food still in their mouth. How do you freeze a mammoth so fast he can't even finish chewing? Well, he could have been buried in ice from the canopy shattering. Crushed by ice. No you see what I'm saying? Three fingers thick. Okay, about an inch and a half, two inches of ice. Okay, that's not going to crush a mammoth. It, it's it's literally not going to crush a mammoth, okay? Because it's likely that as that water broke forth and it burst that canopy, the bigger pieces got thrown away from the earth and the smaller pieces fell because they came up towards the poles and they fell. And as they were moving away and and the earth was cooling down because of the amount of moisture in the atmosphere that we talked about in the last video that ice age would have would have covered most of the northern and most of the southern hemispheres in ice okay and we see evidence of that i mean you know the 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 people acknowledge that there was an ice age you know they it's so funny they'll go they'll go well there was an ice age like 10,000 years ago like yeah actually it was like at about 6,000 years ago, thereabouts, 4,000 years ago. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where they will acknowledge that glaciers existed, that these ice, that this ice age happened, okay, and that, you know, certain things were there, okay. And so, like, and, and they'll even sit there and say, well, you know, we know that there was this lake on the Kaibab Plateau on the other side of the Grand Canyon, on the northern, northeastern side of the Grand Canyon. We know that there was this lake in the Kaibab Plateau, and we know that it drained, they'll say, over millions of years by flowing down what's now known as the Colorado River. But we happen to know that floods can rapidly change the geology of the surrounding layers. And if the rock layers were very, very soft from the flood, then that washed out spillway would have flowed very, very quickly through the Grand Canyon, what's now the Grand Canyon, because water follows the path of least resistance. And I've told people, <laughs> if you don't believe me, Google the Upper Toodle River Valley, okay? Mount St. Helens, May of 1980. That Lahar drastically changed the flow of that river. If you look at it, if you look at what the river valley was pre-eruption 1980 and post-eruption 1980, it drastically changed in about 24 hours. So it's not beyond reckoning that if, if the layers of the earth, the dirt layers, were still soft from the flood, okay, because that's how mountains and, and other things would form, because you can't bend rock, it literally shatters, we know this, um, 
then what would have happened was is that that spillway, the, the, the end of the Kaibab Plateau, which is kind of the beginning of the Colorado River, would have broke open at some point. It's just a washed out spillway. It would have opened at some point and it would have just flowed right through the layers down the path of least resistance and carved out much of what the Grand Canyon is. Now, <clears throat> Kent Hovind will say that it carved out the entire Grand Canyon in about a week. I'm inclined to believe that it probably carved out most of the upper layers, okay, and then it slowed down some as the as the lake got lower and lower, the river slowed down, and so the erosion slowed down, and so the rest of the canyon probably formed until today, okay? Now, we can argue about that all we want, because that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. Because it also seems to me like the the talus on the sides of the canyon, because there's like layers, layers, and then there's like slopes of talus. It seems to me like that might be some of the dirt from the top fell down into the canyon. Because if this was washing out and water doesn't flow uphill that well, <laughs> if if the the top of the Grand Canyon is at 9,000 feet and I think it's like 6,000 feet is where the Kaibab Plateau is, then it probably washed out through those dirt layers and then the upper dirt layers had nothing to support them and so they fell down okay and if you've ever and, and i've told people this go to a sandy beach okay take a take a take a little you know child's shovel with you and dig out a little channel my, my, my brother and my friends and i used to do this all the time when i was a kid okay we would go and we would take a we would take a shovel and and we, we went up to this place called the dunes and we 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 drive up our uh, the river the local river and it was about a half hour up there and um, half hour forty five minutes we drive up there and then we park and then we put a little anchor in the dunes and then we would go out and we would and one of the first things that we would do is we would dig a little hole and then we would dig a channel from that hole down to the river then we would go and we'd get our pail and we would pick up the water and we run up to the top and we dump it in the hole and watch it run down the channel and after a while because the water would erode underneath the sides like this the top portion would get too heavy and it would go and sometimes depending on how much dirt there was okay and how much had been eroded around it, it may create an island, or it may create what you see in the Grand Canyon, which is you see the, the, the talus on the sides, and then it just goes past, and it's just, you know, it's just there. Okay? And then after a while, that would just backfill with dirt over, you know, many thousands of years. So, that's my point. Okay? is that there is evidence all around us. These people are just like, what they're doing is, is they're not looking for that evidence. What they're looking for is they're looking at their geology textbook and it says the layers are millions of years old and yet, they're, and, and so they'll go to the layers and they'll say, okay, this layer is this many millions of years old, this layer is this many millions of years old, this layer is this many millions of years old, this layer is this many millions of years old. We got it, boys. And yet, geologists will admit, and, and my actual Geology 101 professor admitted to the class that they know that there was a global flood because they found certain layers, that certain, certain animals and certain layers all over the earth. And they don't know, and, and, and some of them were in layers at the top of mountains. And this is something that Ken Hovind also talks about. They find like clams dead in the closed position, fossilized at the top of Mount Everest. How does a clam get fossilized at the top of Mount Everest unless the top of Mount Everest was at, was at some point underwater? Because, and we know that it took, it, you know, to be able to create those Himalayas, that Indian plate had to have been going pretty fast. Not, not, the, not, not the, the one that it's moving at today, Okay, it had to be moving freaking quick. Same thing with like the Cascades and all that kind of stuff. 
And and see, that's where they come up with this whole like, well, you see, you look at the Appalachian Mountains and they're old because you know they're they're eroded away. They're not. There's a lot of escarpments. There's a lot of like sharp rocks that haven't been eroded away over millions of years. Okay? It's just that they were created when the North American North American plate, which is where we are, and the and the Pacific plate smashed into each other, okay? It created a small fold on the other side of the of the map, okay? So that's the point. Let's continue. Not buried. To be buried in ice, usually you would have to be within the water before it freezes. Now, this magical mammoth just so happens to be able to withstand huge chunks of ice falling on top of him, all while staying up standing and keeping food in his mouth. Absolutely incredible. You gotta love how they try to conflate the issue. You'll notice how he's like, oh, well, this magical mammoth, and, you know, happens to, you know, do all this kind of stuff. Have you ever heard of a polar vortex, dude? They've actually had things freeze to death. Okay? We've actually seen fish freeze. We've actually seen seals freeze. Okay? And they're not in water. Some of the seals that freeze are you know, like up on land, and they freeze to death. Food in their stomach, food in their mouth, they freeze to death. Okay? Because after the flood, the temperature would have plunged very quickly, especially at the poles. Okay? Because again, that sort of a greenhouse effect of the canopy would have kept the earth at a very fairly constant temperature it might have been colder at the at the poles than it was at the equator but most of the temperature would have been relatively warm okay afterwards when all of that when all of that ice was shunted away there would have been nothing now this guy is thinking that oh see the water comes up it hits this this and, and he's thinking miles thick sheet of ice and breaks it and so all of these chunks are going to rain down and kill everybody that's not how it happened dude again three fingers not not feet thick not hundreds of feet thick not miles thick <laughs> get your head out of your ass and think three fingers about two inches okay that'd be what five centimeters that's not a lot of ice dude okay Stop trying to think up of some magical scenario in where you can try to, you know, envision how it could survive these big chunks of ice. No, it wasn't surviving big chunks of because there were no big chunks of ice. The big chunks of ice would have hit the moon, okay? And that's why we found evidence of water on the moon. Come on, think about it. Animal. If the canopy shattered, the air would spread out, less concentration of oxygen, less air pressure. We're not getting shielded from UV radiation we're soaking in from the sun anymore. We're aging a lot faster as a result of what happened during Noah's flood. The reptiles aren't growing as big as they used to. Here we've got a Jackson chameleon. He's got the three horns, the ridge behind the horns. You could take a good look at his skin. You can see the similarities there between the dinosaurs now. Well, chameleons did evolve shortly after the end of the dinosaurs, around 65 million years ago. <laughs> no, dude. No. No. Chameleons didn't evolve, dude. And why would that chameleon have evolved so small? Okay, why would... Why would if dinosaurs were so big and you know we're supposed to be cuz cuz we're supposed to be evolving from a chimp like ape ancestor some common chimp like ape ancestor millions of years ago and we're getting bigger and better why is it that the chameleon is so small 
Chameleons don't get that big, dude. Okay? What what dinosaur would they have evolved from then? Can you can you explain that? And that's the other thing. When you ask people to show you evidence of one type of animal or kind of animal becoming a different type or kind of animal, they go, ah, well, that's not what we believe. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, we'll get to that here in a second. Because he's going to mention this. I guarantee you, he's going to mention this. We're going to get to this. Just one second. So it's no surprise. If he kept on growing and got to a big size, what do you think you'd call him? Could be a little triceratops right there in the jar. Well, no, because it's a chameleon, isn't it? <laughs> How do you know that the triceratops wasn't a chameleon? How do you know? Again, what you're looking at are bones in the dirt. How do you know that some of these terrible lizards aren't chameleons? That, to me, is so funny that they think they know exactly what these things were from bones in the dirt. Like I said, it would be like me finding the parts of a pen, okay? And then putting it together and saying, wow, look at this pen. It evolved from a pencil 50 million years ago. That's what they're doing. Okay, they're taking animals that lived thousands of years ago and they're saying, we think these things evolved from something else many, 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 many millions of years ago. No, dude, you don't know that. All you know is that it died. That's all you know about it. <laughs> Not a dinosaur. You'd end up having a giant chameleon. So the reptiles... You'd end up having a chameleon with three horns. Okay? Two right above its eyes and one right out of its snout. Gee, what does it look like? What else could it be? But why would it have evolved down? That's my question. Why is everything else evolving smaller when we have evidence of things that are large? Yet, we're supposed to be the ones that are growing bigger? That doesn't make any sense. It has no logical function to it. It is and as if by magic we think this is how it happened. That's it. ...are not growing as big as they used to. What about the veiled chameleon? Doesn't he look like a little dinosaur? He does. Fascinating. Could be a parasaur. Oh. There's an example for you that we might still even be living with these dinosaurs today. They are just not as big as they used to get before the flood. We are all living with dinosaurs today. Lots of them. Okay. Let's address this. So, Scam Man Dan here wants to say that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Okay? So I did some cursory looking around. And guess what? they have as their evidence for this. That and one of these. That's it. Because the keratin protein, okay, that is present in in lizard scales, okay, because it's actually in lizard scales, are present in the feathers of a bird. But they're oriented different in the feathers than they are in the reptile scales. That's why people like Scam Mandan here think that, oh, gee, they do that. 
you know, they're 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 totally, you know, like like they're totally dinosaurs, man. No, they're not. You know what else has keratin? Dogs, cats, humans, fish, whales. Did you know that you have keratin right here on the tips of your fingers and right here? And did you know that the keratin in the tips of your fingers and on your teeth are the same keratin that's in the bird's feathers? It's not different keratin. It's the same keratin. Because keratin is keratin. They call it two different strands. They have alpha keratin and beta keratin. But they're the same. Because they carry the same proteins, the same amino acid chains in the protein. Okay? It's just that one's oriented a little different than the other. In terms of how it's how it's made it's it's oriented a little different it's like laminin okay when we talk about laminin and we show the little cross laminin and people are like oh well, there's like you know 50,000 different types of laminin well no actually there's only like 10 different types of laminin but the laminin that's actually holding your skin together is the cross laminin it's not the other types of laminin Okay, the ones actually holding your cells together that are holding you together, the glue that holds you together is the cross-shaped laminate. So, sorry folks, you can't get away from that one. Okay, and because they look at a bird's legs and they go, wow, that bird leg looks like it has little reptile scales. And look, their feathers have this little thing. And see, we found this, we found this one dinosaur that had... We found this fossilized dinosaur in the dirt that had, uh, that had like some leathery skin in certain places, and it had, uh, and and it had some feathers in others. Oh man, that is totally like the dinosaurs becoming birds. One type of dinosaur. Okay, and and because they look at things like velociraptors and they look at things like the the compies and they look at things like the T-Rex and they go, oh, see, because they walk a little bird-like, right? Because the T-Rex has like short little tiny arms and like big stompy legs, like oh my God, it totally looks like a bird. Well, that's because that's the way that the guy put that together. Number one and number two, yeah, we have found a couple of. Tyrannosaurus Rex skeletons that were mostly whole, okay? So we do kind of know what it looks like, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was evolving from something into a bird. Because you can't prove that that Tyrannosaurus Rex had any offspring. You can't prove that that Tyrannosaurus Rex did anything but die and be buried in layers. That's it. And we know that they're... <laughs> that here again, they're buried in multiple layers because they're not just buried in one layer. They're buried in multiple layers. So again, it, it shouts flood, but they don't want to admit that. It, it's like the polys, it's like it's like the trees that run through the layers. They're like, oh well, um, you know that that tree must have just like gotten stuck in something, and then it, and then it just stayed there and, and petrified over millions of no it doesn't work like that dude and we know petrification doesn't take millions of years <sighs> so come visit dinosaur adventure land come take the science center tour where we go over a lot more details about some of the dinosaurs that are alive today Thanks for joining us. God bless. There is nothing more that I would like than to come to Dinosaur Adventureland and have a science center tour. Trust me on that, Damien. Now, let's... But he'll never do it because he knows if he does go there, his worldview is going to get shattered. If he actually went there and actually tried to debate Kent Hovind in person, okay, like Bill Nye with his Ken Ham, you know, it's so funny, you watch the, you watch the debate between Ken, Bill Nye and Ken Ham, and... You know, it's like every time, I mean, it was a civilized debate, but if you watch it, you know, it's like every time Bill Nye would say something, Ken Ham would just, would just softly rebuttal it, and Bill Nye would get all flustered. Ah, you know, not the way things work, you don't understand anything. 
Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> Move on to Mr. Kent Hovind himself, who is given an, ex an example of the normal tour he takes of Dinosaur Adventureland, where he stops off on the tour to give a little talk about frogs. One of the places we stop on the real tour we take at Dinosaur Adventureland is right here by the fence, where I ask all the kids with me on the tour, or the adults, what is this thing right here? And almost always they say, a frog. Well, yes, it does look like a frog, I guess so. I say, no, look at it again. That's a frog. No, kids, that's a stuffed animal. No, it's not a stuffed animal if you're going to be pedantic, Kent. It's a stuffed toy. Oh, dude. Now you're just ar now you're just arguing semantics. Is this really the best you have? Semantics? Uh, really? You want to say the difference between we call it in America, we call it a stuffed animal. In the UK, you probably call it a stuffed toy. So what? The point is is that Kent is saying, yes, it is a stuffed animal made up to look like a frog. It was designed to look like a frog. That's his point. Good try, though. Nobody with half a brain cell functioning would think of this thing made itself. Very true. Okay. What's that got to do with anything? It's got everything to do with everything, dude. Because you can look at a house and say, wow, that was a beautifully designed house. You can look at you know, a car, and say, that is a beautifully designed car, like a Lamborghini or an Aston Martin. Like, I would love to have an Aston Martin. They're beautifully designed machines. Yet, you look at a human, and you don't say, that is fearfully and wonderfully made, designed. Okay? That's what we believe. And yet, you're going to sit there and think, oh, that human just came by random chance, millions and millions of years. How do you know that? You don't. Okay? You, you know that because somebody showed you a chart. And we're going to get to that in one second. Did somebody make this or did it make itself? Duh, somebody made it. This is a stuffed animal. Now, it looks like a frog. Everybody would agree this thing had a creator. Yep. But they look at a real frog and say, nobody made it. The real frog made itself over millions of years. The real frog has a circulatory system, a digestive system, a reproductive system, a tegumentary system, a skeletal system, a nervous system. I think it was designed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have evidence that the first frogs existed over 250 million years ago. No. What you have are skeletal bones fossilized bones in a dirt in a layer that you have arbitrarily labeled 250 million years ago or 30 million years ago or however many millions of years ago you mentioned there that's what you say because you go well yeah we see we, we see evidence of this of this frog skeleton no a frog got buried in the dirt during the flood and now you're trying to say oh but that's now, this many millions of years ago, because we don't have any other evidence to prove otherwise. Even though the evidence is all around you, you just don't want to look at it. There are 7,371 species of frogs in the world. They might have had a common ancestor called a frog. Yep. That doesn't prove elephants are related to pine trees. And Very no true. one is saying that it does prove this. The Okay, the common ancestor of all frogs is the ichthyostega. But what's really... No, actually, that's the bones that they've assigned to the supposed ancestor of frogs. They have no evidence that that gave birth to anything other than what that is. Okay? And that may have been a frog type back then. It may actually be related to frogs in terms of, like, if they were to match up the DNAs and do all that kind of stuff, it may be a frog type or kind, okay? My point is, you don't have any evidence saying that, yes, this bone in this dirt layer gave birth to frogs 230 million years ago. You don't. 
you're assuming. The interesting is the number of species of frogs just seem to explode around 65 million years ago. No, they don't. You see an entire number of frogs in a dirt layer that you have arbitrarily named 65 million years ago. Look at all these frog species that we see. More likely, they were buried in the dirt during a flood, and then Charles Lyell went, ooh, this layer is this many millions of years, or thousands of years, and this, this layer is many thousands, and this layer is this many thousands, and this layer is this many thousands. And now you're buying into that. Because you have nothing pre-1830 that says that there were anything, anything like that. It wasn't until the 1830s when Charles Lyell was like, I am so sick and tired of the Bible and these Bible-believing scientists out there telling us that the earth is only thousands of years old. I am going to go out there and prove that it is older than that. And so he went out all over England and he started looking at dirt layers and he started arbitrarily labeling them. I wonder why that could be. These atheists, they see the varieties of frogs, which we all agree, and there's a lot of them, 7,000. They'll say, see, boys and girls, look at all these frogs. Yeah, that proves everything's related. No, no teacher, that proves maybe the frogs are related, but it doesn't prove the pine trees are related to whales. Maybe the frogs are related. Maybe. Uh <laughs> okay, maybe Ken's choice of words there were a little off. They are related. What he's saying is, is from a from a student's point of view. You know, when they're saying, you know, when when the teacher's saying this, it's the person, it's it's the it's the child sitting in there going, well, maybe maybe it's just the frogs that are related. That's what he's trying to say. Oh my word! He can't concede anything, can he? Neither can you, son. You guys, I don't know how you can be so dumb in this area. You know somebody made this. You know that. But you think nobody made this. Yep, that's the long and the short of it. Oh. <laughs> Jeez. All right. So let me show you something that you believe. This is one of the things that I absolutely hate about evolutionists is they'll say, we're not related, we're not related, meh. That, that's not how this works. This was taken out of a textbook. Okay? And you see this central line right here. Okay? That central line is saying that everything is related according to you. Now, this is what you believe. You, you literally believe this, okay? You have this common ancestor down here at the bottom that says first primordial form which they say is a single celled bacterial like strain okay and it comes up and it branches out okay into these two and then it branches out into these and oh look plants animals Ooh boy you're saying they were all related. When we say it doesn't prove that plants and animals are like a, like a pine tree is related to an elephant, this is what we're talking about. You guys all believe in this. This is what you believe in. Okay? And you'll see how they have drawn out okay 
where all these supposed animal groups fit in. Even though they have no proof that that's what it is. Okay, and here's another one where it shows a bacteria at the bottom and it comes up into plants on one side and animals on the other and invertebrates up this side. Okay, even though they can't prove that all these things actually are related, what they're doing is, is they're just drawing lines on paper. Okay, they're just arranging everything. So when we say, show us the, you know, half dinosaur, half bird, they point to Archaeopteryx, and we say no, because that's a specific type of animal. You can't prove that there was a that there was a pterodactyl, and then there was another bird, and the Archaeopteryx was right in the middle of that. Okay, show us where the cow becomes the whale. Show us where you know that there's this evidence, and they go, oh well, we don't believe in that. Yeah, you, you don't know what you're talking about. This is literally what we're talking about. Right here. This is what you believe. Is that everything is related. This is no different than a cladogram or, you know, the the stupid um, Haeckel's uh, um, fetuses that are still used today, even though they were actually shown to be forgeries by Haeckel himself during a trial. He was actually convicted of fraud but they still use Haeckel's drawings to try to say, you see how we're related, kids? We're nothing more than animals. And then you wonder why they go and act like animals. Because they don't know that they have a designer. They don't know that they have somebody that created them and loved them and, and cares for them. Okay? People are absolute morons. Let's finish this up. Of course, the stuffed toy was made in a matter of hours, and actual frogs evolved over millions and millions of years. I don't know if I can help that kind of stupid. Maybe there's a pill or something. Try something. Watch my video series on drdino.com, a creation seminar series. Come visit Dinosaur Adventureland. Take the real tour. I totally want to do this someday. So, Dr. Hoven, if you're watching, oh, I totally want to come look down. fun. Um... No, no, I can't. Well, there we go. So that's basically it. So I'm I'm going to go ahead and just kind of give my closing thoughts here, and then I'm going to go ahead and end this episode. I like like Ken Hovind says, I can't help your willing ignorance. Okay, I don't know how many arguments I've gotten into over the last, and, and this is all in that one comment section on the first Simon Dan rebuttal that I did. I have so many people that say that there's no evidence for this book, that it is a fiction book, even though there is literally mountains of evidence. You can walk into any bookstore, you can walk into the religion section, and you can find books by atheists, by biblical scholars, by PhDs, by everybody and their brother on this. Okay? Because the more they try to prove it wrong, the more they end up proving it right. Hell, the Jesus Project, which was a secular project, started to try to sort of demystify Jesus and make him just this, this human prophet who is just a, a, a pretty good guy. Even they admit, okay, that a lot of the events and a lot of the prophecies about Jesus' life and from what they can dig up about Jesus' life from secular writings like actually prove a lot of the, the, the prophecies in the Bible right. Even they have to grudgingly admit that this is a history book. It is. It tells a historical event. Okay? It tells historical events over many, many thousands of years. Okay? And the thing is, atheists all over the place, they listen to people like Scam Man Dan, Professor Dave, Aaron Ra, Matt Dillahunty, I could go on and on. And they sit there and they're like, oh, well, we know that the Bible is fake. We know that the Bible is false. We know that there's no evidence for the Bible. Yes, there is. There's plenty of evidence. You just don't want to look at it because then you would have to come back and say, well, okay, the Bible is actually uh, historical. But, you know, I mean, like, there are parts of it that we can't, that we can't, you know, prove. Doesn't matter at that point. If it's a historical document, then it is telling historical events. Whether or not you want to believe in every single event that happened in it. 
which means that there was a global flood. Okay? I can't help people like this guy. I can pray for him. I do. I pray for him. I pray for the people in my comment section that they will come to know Jesus. Okay? I have softened up my snark a little bit. I've been trying to, you know, like, make it more about God and less about me just owning people. But still, these people come and do this stupid thing. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Ha <laughs> ha. So you lose, I win. That's not an argument, dude. And I, and I literally had... In my comments on comment section, somebody come up to me and, and, and call me a dumb nut tugger. And then another guy, and, and when I press that guy on it, then another guy comes over and says, well, we just feel that it's easier just to call you names than to actually argue with you. Dude, if I were to go to Scam Man Dan's page over here and say, the evolution church needs dumb nut tuggers like Scam Man Dan here. What do you think each commenter, atheist commenter, would say? They would come and say to me, Well, you're a Christian. You're not supposed to act like that. You're not supposed to call people names. Who died and made you the arbiter of morality? It's okay when you do it, right? Right? No. It is time to start calling these people out for what it is. And it is time to start exposing them for what they are. Okay? And it is time for us to stand up to people like Scam Man Dan, Professor Dave, Aaron Raw, Matt Dillahunty, I could go on and on, him, genetically modified skeptic, the, the, uh, God, I can't remember some of the other guys, but anyway, off the top of my head, there's a bunch of them out there, okay? And we need to start pushing back on these guys, okay? And we need to start exposing them for what they are. Just like the flat earth has con men that walk around and spout these same fallacies over and over and over again, we need to do the same thing with them. Okay? We need to expose their lies because we now know, and it's so funny how <laughs> this guy can sit there and go, oh, well, you know, that frog was probably made in a matter of hours, but the frog made itself over millions and millions of years. No. Because frogs are still being made today in a matter of days whatever the gestation period of a frog is. I'll put it down here. <laughs> like, <laughs> come on, man. Seriously. Okay? It blows my mind that these guys literally can sit there and look at a house and go, that is wonderfully designed. And yet they look at, a, at another human being or they look at an animal and they go, that evolved. They have no evidence of it. All they have is bones in the dirt. That's it. That's all they have. They have bones in the dirt. And that's their only evidence. And they have lines on paper. That's it. They, they literally have this. They literally have this. Just lines on paper. To try to prove their theory. This is not science, folks. Because they have no evidence that this actually happened. They're just drawing lines on paper. Again, they're just throwing shit to the wall and hoping it sticks. And it's not sticking because people like me are starting to stand up and go, ah, 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 that doesn't make any sense, dude. So you need to figure this out. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, drop a comment below. Let me know what you think about this um, quick series. I know this one ran a little long. Um, but... I felt like I needed to kind of talk at the end of this thing to kind of expose this stuff, okay? And I truly hope that this helps you Christians out there and for you non-Christians, if you made it this far, thank you for listening. 
and I hope we can have a respectful conversation down below in the comment section. So, now that I have this one out, um, I just filmed my um, amazing Spider-Man uh, duology um, retrospective. That'll be out um, as of filming this. Um, I'll, I'll be getting these out at about the same time. So I just wanted to let you know that I got that done and it'll be up. So um, if you are, then um, just click on my name down below and um, head over to my channel and check out my um, Spider-Man retrospective where I'm talking about the original Spider-Man trilogy. I'm talking about the Spider-Man duology and I also touched on um, Captain America Civil War and um, and in the next episode for that I'm going to talk about um, the uh, Homecoming and then the events of Infinity War and Endgame and then, and then the last two movies of the home trilogy it's because i saw spider-man no way home and oh my god was it amazing and i absolutely just fell in love with that movie um and i know i just saw a preview because i know that i'm a huge transformers fan i'll just let you know that right now i'm a huge g1 transformers fan and um i know that they kind of screwed up i liked age of extinction transformers 4 age of extinction was amazing but I didn't. I haven't watched the last night because it just kind of frustrates me that they made Prime into kind of a villain. It just Prime is not a villain, damn it. Um, but I know that after that they came out with Bumblebee. I haven't watched that movie. I just, I just kind of was like, I'm done with Transformers for a while, but I might end up picking it up and watching it because they just announced that they're doing a brand new Transformers movie, and. I am stoked because it looks amazing and when they showed Prime driving across one of the bridges and I believe it was in New York um, he was driving across the bridge and it was him in his original G1 sort of like Age of Extinction in his G1 look he didn't have he wasn't the Peterbilt with the long snout he was he was the short snouted um, truck um, semi truck um, cab so and, and he had the blue um, legs and he had the red cab oh man I'm stoked to watch that so um, and that's coming out next next year so this is December 2022 as of filming this so you know if you're watching this in the future and the movie's out as probably there's probably a review of it but just know that if you're watching it now I'm stoked for it and there will be a review of that movie when it comes out and I'm also probably going to do a John Wick um, retrospective because the new John Wick movie is coming out next year. And I can't wait for that because that looks badass as well. So, um, you know, again, smash that like button, hit subscribe, drop a comment below. Let me know what you thought of this. And um, as we always say, we will see you on the next one.